Welcome everyone! In this video I thought I would be giving a small introduction to FS2, a very useful um, library of the Scala ecosystem. FS2 is a library for stream processing. In fact, FS2 stands for Functional Streams for Scala. Now, in this video uh, we will talk about what streams are, um, how are they useful, when do you need them, but before we do I'd like you to consider um, the following use cases. So imagine you're building an application, and in that application you need to transfer data from one system to another. Um, let's say you have a legacy system and the new system that you're building and you want to transfer data between the two. And the format of, the, of these data is probably going to be different between the two systems, so you want to implement some kind of translation between the two. This is one use case that you can solve using streams. Another use case is reading and writing from big data files. So maybe you have a big CSV file with a lot of data, or maybe a big JSON file, or maybe you're reading data from some data store and you want to store it, write it to a file so you can upload it uh, to an FTP server or a cloud service. Um, in this video, we will show how FS2 can help you uh, read and parse very big files easily. And the last use case that I'd like to talk about is uh, processing real-time events. So maybe you're building a website where you want to implement some kind of real-time communication between your users. Maybe you have a WebSocket connection between your server and your client, and your client is sending data to your server in real-time, and you want to be able to process that data, to store it to some uh, database. So again, this is a use case that you can implement with streams. In fact, all these use cases have something in common. They either involve data sets that are too big to fit in memory all at once, so for example this reading of a, mess of a massive file, or they involve data that changes over time. Um, data sources that emit data um, over time and you want to be able to process that data as you receive it. In fact, streams are an abstraction that allows you to do just that. So you can think of them as a data source where data um, evolves over time, it gets emitted over time. So instead of, ha of having a collection of finite data, a finite amount of data uh, that you can uh, transform, you have the representation of um, a source of data where data gets emitted over time and you want to be able to transform that data as you receive it. And streams allow you to model um, things like uh, network connections, um, reading big files without, uh, without overflowing your memory, processing real-time events, um, all these use cases. Uh, streams also allow you to build massively concurrent applications. Uh, you can process elements that you receive one by one, but you can also process them concurrently using operators that uh, take advantage of multi-threading to make the processing go uh, faster in some cases. Uh, you can also take multiple streams and merge them and all the streams will run concurrently so you can perform multiple uh, pipelines of data transformations at the same time on the same computer. And all that you can do with a familiar list-like interface. So all the operators like map and filter and collect that you already know from working with the collections, they work just the way you would expect with streams. So streams are actually very easy to pick up, uh, but it's, it's like having a list, but instead of having a finite list with a finite amount of data, you have um, a sort of collection where uh, data evolves over time. But all the operators you already know and love work the way you would expect. And finally, FS2 also puts a special emphasis on safety. Uh, we will go over what this means, but in FS2 you have proper allocation and uh, closing of resources. Uh, you also get a proper tracking of side effects. Um, uh, um, FS2 allows you to model effectful streams uh, using IO monads like uh, the IO monads that you would find in Cats Effect IO or any uh, data structure that implements the type classes from Cats Effect. Uh, so there is this uh, strong separation between pure streams 
and effectful streams as we will uh, show later in the video and you have also a pool based communication between stages of your streams a pool based communication between your producer and your consumer uh, what this means essentially is that uh, when you have a slow consumer and a faster producer the faster producer cannot um, overwhelm the slow consumer uh, and, and if that would be the case then eventually your memory will blow up and if it's too since everything is pool based uh, this shouldn't happen which is usually a good thing let's see how fs2 works uh, in practice all right let's see the code so i have prepared a few examples to show you how fs2 works the first of these examples is how to create pure streams. So the way we create pure streams using FS2 is via the apply method, uh, just like you would create a list or a vector. So if I want to create a stream of integer, I can just type uh, pure stream and then write uh, something like this. One, two, three, and four. Um, the stream here comes from the FS2 package, uh, so I have imported it using an import statement. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, you will end up with, uh, with uh, something else entirely, because um, the Scala library also defines a uh, stream structure, so make sure that you have imported the stream from FS2, because if you don't, you will end up with a Scala stream, which is not what, you, what we want in that case. All right, so uh, let's put the import right back and you can see that uh, it gives me a stream type. Uh, actually, if I put my uh, mouse over there, you can see the type of the stream we just created and you can see that this is a stream event. Uh, we will not go over what this nothing part means for the moment. Um, it just means that this is a pure stream. In fact, um, FS2 uh, exports a type alias for nothing which is called pure and if I write uh, the, the signature of my value explicitly I can tell the compiler that this is a stream which is defined by a pure type parameter and a int type parameter um, <clears throat> All right, so pure streams are streams that don't have any side effects. They're just collections of values that you manipulate using pure operators, such as map, filter, and, uh, and collect, and all the operators uh, that you find on other data structures. Um, if you want to transform a stream to another data structure, such as a list, so you can uh, send it to another method, manipulate it the way you would manipulate the list, you can compile a stream to a list using a compile um, uh, one of the methods that are defined on the compile projection that you get when you type uh, your stream compile. This gives you gives you a type compile ops, which is a special projection of your streams that allows it to be compiled to another data structure. And when you type uh, dot to list it gives you a list of elements, uh, so the four elements that we have defined earlier. Uh, let's see another example. I will define uh, two streams, uh, so let's see a stream A uh, with strings in it, so I will put uh, John and Ringo and then a stream B and in it I will put um, George and Paul and I want to do a concatenation of these two streams and they work exactly the way you would expect so these are the same operators that uh, you use to concatenate a list you can take your first stream um, put a plus plus here and then your second stream and it gives you another stream of elements and then when you compile that that concatenate concatenate it uh, stream to a list uh, using the same operators that we just used well actually make it a vector so if we, if we compile it to a vector we get a vector of all the elements that we had in our two previous streams 
So very simple. Uh, right now, streams are not very useful because they work um, just the way collection works. So uh, they work like any strict collection. You have all your elements in memory all at once and you manipulate it using uh, the same operators. Let's do something more useful with streams. So these are pure streams. You can see they are pure, pure streams because uh, it's reflected in their type. Uh, the first type parameter on the stream data structure is a type parameter that defines the effect of your stream, uh, the data structure that you will use to perform side effects. And if that effect happens to be pure, well, it means that this uh, particular stream doesn't have any side effects. Uh, we will go over how effects work a little later. Uh, the second type parameter, obviously, is uh, the type of uh, elements that you will find in your stream. So if you create a stream of integer, uh, then uh, this type will be int. And if you create a, a stream of lists, um, a stream of strings, sorry, uh, this type will be a string. Uh, let's do something more useful with streams. So the second example is um, effectful streams. All right, so um, like like in the previous example, we'll start by importing uh, uh, the FS2 package, and then I will also import the cats.effect the IO structure, uh, which will be useful later. Um, like in the previous example, we will start with a pure stream of elements. So let me create it using stream.apply John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And once I have this stream, this pure stream, um, what I want is to be able to react to the data inside that stream and execute some side effects. So the way we do it is we take that pure stream and then instead of using a pure operator such as map, I will use uh, an operator called eval map. And eval map works kind of like map. So it allows you to transform data that comes from the stream, but the signature is slightly different. Instead of passing in a pure function, you pass it a, an effectful function, a function from an element of the stream to um, a value wrapped inside an effect, such as cats.effect.io, which is usually the structure we use when we deal with FS2. So if I take that stream and then I say, um, so this is a name element and I want to perform a, an effectful computation such as um, get something from the database. So actually let's define a function over there. Um, get age according to name and it returns an IO of int. And we will just say that it returns an IO of the length of the name. It's, it's a pretty stupid implementation, but uh, it works for the example. So uh, we have that function and now we can just pass it to the evil map operator. And you can see that what I get back as a type is a stream but not a pure stream anymore. It's a stream defined by an IO uh, effect. So it's an effectful stream. You can see that the first type parameter here is IO, where we had pure in the first place, and the second type operator, uh, the second type um, argument here is int, uh, because we have transformed our stream of strings to a stream of ints. All right, so FS2 defines eval map, which is the effectful equivalent to map, and it also defines eval filter, uh, which works the way you would expect. So it's an effectful filtering function. Uh, so if I want to filter elements from my stream uh, using uh, that operator, I could do, for example, uh, something like this. 
uh, let's see I want to filter only if the name if the name contains an O so now I have a an effectful stream and the nice thing about um, effectful streams is that just like IO monads are lazy representations of effectful programs that won't run your side effects before you explicitly run the IO monad. When you have an effectful stream, uh, all the side effects contained inside the, the stages of your stream uh, won't run either. So what you get is essentially a lazy representation of a stream which, uh, which for the moment doesn't do anything. One way we can execute the stream and the side effects that go with it is by compiling it, just like earlier. So we take the stream, we type doc compile, and then uh, we have several uh, operations that we can do on it. And you can see that if I take, um, actually, it won't work because I have named our effectful stream. Let's take the first one and let's call it effectful stream like this. Um, if I take that effectful stream and I type dot compile and dot to list, you can see that compared to earlier where uh, it gave us a list immediately, now it gives us an IO of a list, so a pure representation of a list. And we can compile that stream to an IO, and then we need to run it explicitly to get our data. And the side effects associated with the, that stream have been transformed to a single IO that also delays the execution of these side effects. So these side effects they won't run until you explicitly run the IO and when you do something like unsafe run sync it runs the stream and it runs all the associated effects. Let's uh, print something uh, for each element in the stream. So we have seen how evil map works let's see how we can uh, perform a side effect for every element of the stream without transforming the stream itself. So let's take this stream we had earlier. Actually I'm going to remove that and I want to take that stream and then I want to, to print every element of the stream to the console. I could do that with an evil map and then take that element and then do something like uh, a print line receive name but the issue with it is that oops sorry I forgot to wrap the call to print line in an IO and the, the issue with that is that it gives me back a stream of units so I have an effectful stream, but I have lost the data that I had before I did this, uh, this side effect. But when I want to perform a side effect without transforming the content of the stream, there is an operator for that called eval tap. So eval tap works like eval map, but instead of transforming the data, it merely executes a side effect for every element that you receive in the stream. And you can see that the return type of, of this whole stream here is an IO, it is a stream of strings. Let's see different ways of compiling it. So the issue with compile to list is that it will attempt to take the, the, the whole stream and compile it to a strict collection in memory. Uh, which is usually not what you want because if the data set is very big then uh, your program will crash uh, with an out of memory error. Uh, instead what you can do to avoid taking the whole stream in memory all at once is using something like uh, last which gives you only the last element of the stream when uh, the stream terminates. And you can see that the last element of the stream here is uh, Ringo's, which is the element uh, which I was expecting. Um, another way to compile streams is using drain. So drain returns an IO of unit. Drain is useful when you don't care about the data inside a stream, but you only care about the execution of side effects. And it will give you an IO of unit, an effect, an effect 
that when you run it will run the stream and all the side effects associated with it, but it won't give you any data back. So if we do that and we run this, this, it gives me nothing uh, as a result. It gives me a unit, but it still performs the side effects. Actually, if I put my, my mouse over there, you can see all the call to all the, the things that were printed in the console. All right, so this is how uh, pure streams and effectful streams work in FS2. But the streams we've been building so far are not very useful because there's nothing much you, you, we've done so far that you can't model using just regular collections like lists. Uh, where streams really shine, apart from their, uh, um, apart from their ability to separate uh, pure operations from uh, from effectful operations, is the way they allow us to model infinite uh, collections. Uh, so this is the next example. Uh, how, let's see how we can build infinite streams using FS2. So FS2 exposes a few ways of creating, of creating um, infinite streams. We've seen how to create uh, streams from a finite set of elements. Let's see how we can create, for example, an infinite stream that always repeats the same element. So there is a method called constant. And constant, what it does is take a single value, such as ping, and return a stream, uh, an infinite stream, a stream that never terminates and always emits uh, that value. And now that we have this infinite stream, we can actually choose how many um, elements that we want to take. So imagine we want to transform this into a list. We could take the stream and then use a take operators to limit the stream to um, a, a finite number of elements, such as 20, and then we can compile it to a list. And it gives us a list of 20 elements, which are all the same. Um, I've chosen 20, I've, I could have chosen any number. Another way that you can uh, create an infinite stream is by repeating a particular pattern. So we start with a simple stream, such as a stream of, of elements one, two, and three. And then we can call the repeat operator on that stream. And what it gives us is an infinite stream where the first stream that we have is repeated over and over. So if we take that, and then take, let's say, 50 elements and compile it to a list, it gives me a list with that repeated pattern over and over. And again, I could have chosen any number, 50, 20, 10, it doesn't matter, it's an infinite stream. Uh, if I don't limit the number of elements in that stream and try to compile it to a list, uh, well, then the program will crash because uh, it will attempt to put an infinite number of values inside a finite memory. And finally, one last way that we can use to create infinite streams is by creating a stream according to a particular timing. So there is an operator in FS2 called awake every, and that operator allows us to create a stream that emits one element um, every second or every minute or whatever uh, duration we choose. Uh, let's see how this operator works. So I will need a few imports. I will import cats.effect, the IO and timer. I will need an instance of timer from cats effect for this operator to work. I will also need import the uh, sorry, Scala dot du uh, well, concurrent dot duration dot underscore. Once I have these imports, what I can do is write stream dot awake every. It's 
specify that what I want is uh, as an effect type is IO from Cat's Effects and then pass it a finite duration such as 5 seconds. Now it will complain because um, it doesn't find uh, an instance of timer for that particular effect yet. So I need to create that timer. Uh, usually that timer will be provided for you automatically when you use an IO app as the type for your main class. But here, since we are, we are in a worksheet, I will create the timer manually. So to create the timer, I will use IO.timer and pass it execution context dot global and then well it complains because postfix notation isn't uh, enabled so I will use a dot here and it gives us a stream and now let's try to take let's see two elements of this stream so it should last about 10 seconds and compile it to a list and run it using unsafe run sync. It will take a moment. All right, so it works. And uh, you can see that uh, it has emitted two elements and every element is a finite duration. And it's actually the time from the beginning of the stream, from the first conception of the stream. So, so the first element is five seconds and the second element is 10 seconds. And if I were to take 10 elements, then I would have five, 10, 15, 20, uh, and so on and so on. Um, and again, this is an infinite stream. So if we uh, forget to limit the number of elements that we want uh, and try to put them in memory all at once, eventually the program will crash, except it will take a very long time because it only emits element, uh, one element every five seconds. Let's see how FS2 enables us to read and parse a very big file. So I have prepared a simple example with a big CSV file, which I have downloaded from the internet. Uh, it's right here and you can see that the file is almost uh, three gigabytes. But I want to showcase how uh, it's actually very easy to read and parse such a very big file uh, using FS2. All right, so I have prepared a few things here. I've started by creating the main class of the application by inheriting from the IO app trait, which is defined in Cat's Effect. And the IO app trait allows you to define the main class of your application, um, except that instead of having a run method that returns a unit, you have a run method that returns an IO of an exit code. So that allows you to define an application where your application is actually some IO that you want to run. And I have also defined a case class uh, that we will use to decode all the columns uh, uh, from uh, our file. Actually, not all the columns. I, I, uh, there are a lot of, lot of, of columns in that file and I've just uh, define the first 10 and what we want to do is read the the CSV file uh, do some filtering on it uh, some parsing and then some filtering on it and then export um, the filter data as JSON so the first thing we want to do here is create a blocker so a blocker is a type defined in cat's effect and it works essentially like a context shift. So it's the representation of a thread pool. But instead of being a finite thread pool, a blocker is specifically designed to handle IO bound computation. So let's re edit that blocker uh, by typing blocker of IO right here. And what it gives us is a resource. So it's a handle to uh, something that must be specifically allocated and properly closed and the way we will ensure that that this resource is properly closed is by using the use operator that allows us 
to access that blocker and it expects us to provide an IO and everything that happens in that IO will uh, have access to the blocker and once the IO is done running the resource will be properly closed. Actually let's not open an IO right now. Let's start by creating a stream. So I have a few imports here and I have imported FS2 and what I want to do is um, read the file using FS2. Um, FS2 has a special IO package that exposes a few utilities that allow us to deal with TCP servers and clients, uh, UDP uh, networking and also reading and writing uh, from N2 files. Uh, you can see in my build.sbt that on top of having FS2 core and Cersei as a dependency, I also have a dependency on this particular package which is called fs2io uh, which is what we will use right now to read the file and once I have fs2.io I can just type fs2.io file dot read all uh, I will put an io type parameter right here and you can see that it expects a few things it expects a path which is the path of the file we want to read a blocker which is the one we have just created and a chunk size which will be uh, the number of bytes that it will attempt to read at a given time so the path will be our uh, input I think it is called data set uh, to path uh, our blocker will be blocker and our chunk size will be, uh, let's make it um, 4096, which is the number of bytes that it will attempt to read at once. And it gives us a stream of bytes. Now the next step we want to do is transform that stream of bytes into a stream of, uh, of streams using some kind of, of transformation between a byte and a UTF-8 uh, character and fs2 already defines it for us so what we can do is uh, take that stream called the dot through method which allows us to pass a, a pipe which is a function from a stream to a stream and once we have done that we can pass it text dot udfa decode which is a pipe defined in the fs2 package which takes a stream of bytes and transforms it into a stream of strings. And once we have a stream of strings, we have yet another transformation to go through, uh, which is text dot uh, lines, which takes a stream of, of strings and returns a stream of strings split according to uh, new line characters. So what we will get is a stream of every line in the file. And in a CSV file, every line is a row. So that's very convenient. So now we have this uh, stream of lines. And what we want to do is uh, split these lines uh, into columns and then create our uh, instance of our case class. So what we will do is map over the stream and then take this line and split it according to a tab character because in that case uh, the separator used in the data set that I am using is not a comma, it's a tab character. So this is how we can split every line into columns. And what it gives us is a stream of arrays of strings where every string in every array is a value in a particular column. Then I can call collect on that um, stream and then create a pattern matching expression that allows me to, um, to extract every column from the array. So, it's a bit tedious, but what I want to do essentially is do something like this. This is one big pattern matching expression. So let's make it 
a little cleaner. And then once we have extracted every column in the array, we can use our case class. So actually this is going to be pretty much the same thing. So let me just copy and paste it. So now we have a stream of rows and what we want is transform every row to a JSON object. So to do that, I will map over the stream and then transform every row to a JSON object using add.asJSON and then to a JSON string using dot no spaces. Uh, all these operators, um, I have access to them because I have imported io.cersi.syntax which gives us access to uh, the nice as json operator and io.cersi.generate.odo which gives us an automatic encoder for our case class right here. Uh, without that import I would have to define the encoder uh, by hand but fortunately I don't have to do that in that case. Alright, now I have a stream of rules. What I want to do is write these rows back to a file. So we start by encoding every string to uh, to bytes using UTF-8 by passing it to text.utf8 encode. So this gives us a stream of bytes and then rewrite it to a file using fs2.io.txt um, sorry, the io .file write all and write all expects a path, so I will give it output.toPath and it expects a blocker, so I will give us our blocker. And that's it. Now it still complains because it expects an io of exec code and I, uh, I've given it a stream, so we need a way to compile this stream uh, into a single IO. Uh, so to do that we will use dot compile and then dot drain because we don't actually care about the values in the stream we just care about the side effect of reading and writing to a file. So this gives me an IO of unit and then once I have this IO of unit I can actually let me put a log right here to tell uh, when the program is done. So I will append sort of an, another IO right here using uh, this operator and write done. Actually this operator right here is just a, an alias for a flat map like this and then you put the IO and then you put the print line. So it's just a nicer way of, uh, of executing one effect after the other and then what we can do is take all of this and it call the dot as operator and pass it execute.success well it doesn't work because probably I have forgotten something oh all right it's because of the it's because of the the line break here. So this simple program should be enough to read that very big CSV file, convert it to JSON, filter it, and then write it back to a file. Actually, I've forgotten about the, the filtering part, so let's make it a little bit more complex. Add a filter, and then I only want rows uh, whose generic name isn't empty. All right, and now let's fire up a terminal and run the program. All right, now we're done. And you can see that it has read and, trans and passed and transformed this big data file in just 38 seconds. And this is without JVM warmup. And when we open it, oh, actually that was a bad idea. I pretty much crashed the editor. That's all right. Still, you can see that that's proper JSON. All right, so that, that was a bad idea. Don't try to open a several gigabyte file into VS Code. There are a few ways we can improve that program because the format that we used is pretty much garbage at this point. I mean, we have a file of JSON object, but every object isn't separated either by a comma or a line break. 
So to remedy that, what we can do is go right here and add an interspace. So interspace allows us to um, emit a separator between every pair of element in the stream. And what I want to emit is a line break. So instead of having this big file where everything is on one line, now I have a, a file where we have one JSON object per line. And um, finally, uh, let's improve uh, the code a little bit using pipes. Uh, so pipes allow us to define reusable transformations. Uh, they're essentially functions from one stream to another. And what I want here is all that parsing logic ex uh, exported to uh, a separate pipe. So let's define it. I will create a pipe called um, pass CSV and the type of that pipe will be a pipe. Pipe is defined by three type parameters. The first one is the effect of our stream. The, the second one is the type of the first stream, the type of elements of the first stream and the second. And the third uh, type parameter is the type of elements that we want in our resulting stream. So it's the type of elements that we get after the transformation. Uh, so in that case, it will be byte. And the output will be wall. So it's a byte that allows us to transform a string of bytes to a stream of rows. And pipes are just functions from one string to another. So we can just define a function like this and then take all of, of these uh, steps here and put them here. And there's actually an even shorter way of doing this by using a the underscore syntax for anonymous functions. A little bit of formatting. And then we've just taken every step uh, that we had before and, and put it in a separate pipe. And now we can just use it using the through operators that we've been using uh, uh, so far with our own custom pipe. So, and maybe what I want is a, another pipe uh, from a raw to a JSON uh, string, so let de let's define another pipe, which is a pipe from a wall to two bytes. And then we can use that new pipe like this. So it's exactly the same program, only a little cleaner because I've been able to take these transformations and, and put them in a pipe so that we can reuse them in other streams. And you can do more complex things than that. You can use generics, uh, so type parameters, uh, to create transformations that operate on more than just IO as the effect type, and maybe uh, several different types of inputs and outputs. Um, it's, it's really up to you. So everything you can do in a single stream, you can do in several separate steps. You just have to take the steps from the stream and create a pipe from, from them. All right, so that's a wrap. In this video, we've seen how FS2 works, uh, what were streams and how FS2 enables us to model infinite streams of values, both pure streams and effectful streams, streams that have side effects, thanks to a tight integration with Cats Effect IO or any IO monad that implements the type classes from Cats, uh, from Cats Effect. Uh, we've also seen how FS2 enables us to read from a very big file, pass it, transform it, and then write back to another big file, all without having to keep all the data at once in memory, uh, which would have crashed the application. So what I want to do in another video is talk a little bit about 
cues and topics and how FS2 enables us to integrate with data sources that are push-based instead of pull-based. So data sources where you can emit data uh, programmatically uh, and, and we will see uh, how that works and um, what it means for our memory management to integrate with uh, these data sources. I hope you've enjoyed the video, tell me what you think in the comments down below and I'll see you next time.